Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Mini Astro Workshop Series 2020. So today with us we have uh, Ayan Acharya, who has recently completed his PhD at uh, Australian National University. His main research interest revolves around uh, galaxy evolution and chemical evolution. And he has uh, done his uh, PhD with the thesis title as Chemical Evolution of the Universe Across the Cosmic Time. And he'll be joining John Hopkins University uh, to start his postdoc soon. And apart from that, uh, he did his uh, bachelor's uh, um, integrated bachelor's and master's in science from uh, IIT Kharagpur, wherein he did a thesis on uh, simulating hydrogen two bubble around uh, quasars so that he can map the redshift at 21 centimeter lines using mass filtering. And he has received numerous awards, uh, uh, like as part of uh, while he was in undergrad, during his graduate, uh, and a lot of other. And he's also an observer, uh, like he actually even worked at the Keck Observatory that is present in Hawaii. And then he has also uh, uh, like worked, I think, for a little time at the As uh, Australian National University 2.3 meter telescope. So uh, as part of this series so far, we have heard mainly really theoretical astrophysics uh, and a uh, little bit on the skills that are required to be a good uh, uh, theoretical and computational astrophysics. But in this talk, uh, we will actually get the other side of the things which are equally important, the observation aspects, in which today our speaker is going to talk about what the basics of observations and galaxy evolution are. With that, uh, Ayan, you can kick it off. Thank you, Surendra, for that lovely introduction. Uh, um, hi, everyone. Hope everyone is safe and healthy amidst this uh, ongoing pandemic. Uh, in the series of mini astro workshop talks, we have already heard about coding, basic astronomy, star formation, gravitational waves, neutron stars, and et cetera. And as Surinder pointed out, it has, as far as I understand, been mostly or sort of inclined towards theoretical aspects. So that's why I decided today I will be talking about something slightly different, but something much more broad. Uh, so I decided we're, we're gonna talk about the galaxies uh, and how, they galax how the galaxies change and evolve in cosmic time, but primarily focusing on observation. In fact, we are going to talk about galaxies in the distant past. So not just any galaxy, but we are going to time travel back into the past and then study how the universe and how the galaxies look like when the universe was a baby. Before I begin, uh, just a little bit of, about myself. Uh, even though Surinder pretty much covered everything, I recently completed my PhD from the uh, Australian National University. And my research is basically on studying the chemical buildup in the universe. So basically building blocks of matter like oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, these elements are what I'm interested in. And I look for these elements in very distant galaxies. And as I already mentioned, today I'm going to demonstrate very, in a very basic way how we can study the evolution of galaxies using these observations. Now, now the purpose of this talk, as I said, is to give you a broad and very basic introduction. Um, I'll cover simulations and observations both, but I'll be focusing more on the latter. In the later part of my talk, I will briefly highlight some of the research that I personally did and the future prospects in this field. Uh, now, I'm sure that in the first part of this talk, uh, it might seem very basic to some of you, if not many of you. So please bear with me for that part. I promise I have more advanced stuff for you in the later half of the talk. For those of you who are already familiar with the basic concepts of observation or spectroscopy, um, for them, I would like to quote Albert Dumbledore, and say, you know, please feel free to allow your attention to wander freely during the first half of the talk. I should also mention before I begin that if you have any questions uh, during the talk, uh, please put it in the chat box and uh, I'm sure Sandra will pass those questions on to me. All right, so <clears throat> let's begin by talking briefly about simulations. What is a simulation? Well, a simulation is basically a toy model of the universe, a replica of the real world stars and galaxies, but these are made inside a computer using some computer programs and laws of physics. 
you can think of it like, let's say, a video game. And just like a video game, we have full control on how we want our galaxies and stars to look like, how we want them to behave, because we have created them. This amount of control that simulations give us is actually the main selling point of simulation. Because you see, we can understand what's going on in the real universe by fine tuning or polishing our simulations to make them look as much as possible same as the real universe or the real data. Observations, on the other hand, they are hard facts. We see what we see, right? What we are, if we look at it, if we look through a telescope at a star or a galaxy or a planet, what we see is what is out there, right? There is no doubt about that. So observation, observational study basically involves collection of the data, storage and analysis of the data, where, um, and the, so that we can try and understand what is actually going on in the real world. So at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that I look for building blocks of life, right? Like these elements, carbon, oxygen, and so on. Now in science, it is very important to ask the right question in a precise way. So let's ask what is the big question we are trying to answer? Well, we are trying to understand how galaxies grow and change over time. But we need to, need to further narrow down this question. So let us briefly, with the help of some simulations, to narrow down on this question, and then we can delve freely into the world of observations. So let's first look at the simulation of a chunk of the whole universe, right? As, as most of you, or all of you already know, that the universe was produced or created after the Big Bang about 13.8 billion years ago, and then from, since then it has been growing and changing. In this particular video, and I'm assuming that the video is playing okay, uh, if it is not, please stop me at any time. So in the video, each cluster of dots that you see, they are act each of them is actually a galaxy. And this video shows a big chunk of the universe. This simulation shows a big chunk of the universe. And all of these tiny dots, you can see that they're, they're of different colors. Some of them are yellow, green, red. The redder they are, it means more of these metals, more of these elements are present in them, more carbon, more oxygen, and so on. Now, obviously, this is quite literally speaking, the big picture, because we are like zoomed out a lot. So let's zoom in a bit more and let's look at individual galaxies. Now these two simulations that you see here, they are of individual single galaxies. But even then, if you notice closely, each dot in these simulations is actually a star, which means there are so many stars in the galaxy and stars are actually the central point or the center of attraction of our story, because the main thing, the production of these building blocks of life actually takes place inside a star. In particular, if you focus on the right-hand side video and you look at these red bubbles, blobs, sort of growing and exploding, that's actually where new stars are being born and then they're exploding as supernovae. That's what's creating those bubbles. And again, this is all simulation. All right, so let's look a little bit more in, let, let's zoom in a bit more and look at individual stars. In this last set of simulations that I'll be showing you, we see how gas clouds within individual galaxies, how gas clouds are sort of come together due to their gravitational attraction, and then they collapse to form stars. Those white dots or the bright spots that you see in the simulation after the star has formed from the gas that is collapsing around it. So once the star is formed, that is when the fun begins. Because as we all know, once the star has formed, we get we have nuclear fusion taking place inside the star. And that's where these elements, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and many other elements, they are formed inside the star. Now, some elements are produced by the nuclear fusion, as we know, in the star's cores, while the others are produced in the extreme heat and pressure that is generated when the star explodes as supernova. Now, why do we care about these elements? Right? Other than the obvious fact that you know, we, they constitute everything that we see around us, our planet, our, all the life forms, including us. The other main reason is because the way these elements are produced and distributed across galaxies, that has an immense impact on how the galaxies grow and how they evolve, how they build themselves up. And because we want to study galaxy evolution, we have to study how these elements had, you know, came into, came into place. 
So the information about all this, how these elements affect the galaxy evolution, how they, how they you know, make the galaxy grow, is all encrypted within the light that is being emitted by these galaxies made of these billions and billions of stars. So if we do want to study galaxy evolution, we want to study how these elements were formed and distributed in the galaxies. And for that, our primary aim, the most basic aim, is first to be able to collect the light from that galaxy or from these galaxies. But then that leads to the question, exactly which galaxies do we want to study? Which galaxies do we want to point our telescopes at? There are hundreds of billions of galaxies out there. So in order to choose which galaxies would be most important or most suitable for studying galaxy evolution, let us look at a different representation of our universe. Now this universe is represented across different times. Some of you may already be familiar with this representation, but for those who are not, on this particular figure towards the right is current time or present day. As we go towards the left is past or backwards time, right? So that's why we have the Big Bang where time is starting at the very leftmost edge of the figure. And at the rightmost edge is what we have as today, where the, the universe that we are seeing around us. The useful an interesting thing about this diagram is that it also tells us about the distance of the universe from us. So as just as the right side of this figure shows present day, the right side of this figure also shows the nearby galaxy or the nearby universe. As we go from right to left on this figure, we go from near to far away, to distant objects. In other words, we call that, we, we represent distance in the units of redshift in astronomy. Low redshift corresponds to low, small distance or nearby universe. High redshift, which is towards the left of this plot, corresponds to distant universe, very far away galaxy. Now, we are, as I said, we are basically here in the local universe, right? And because the local universe is so close to us, by definition, it is very, it is easy to observe. And that is why it has been fairly well understood. It has been quite thoroughly studied. The problem lies in studying slightly farther away universe, the distant universe, because that's, there's a lot of gray area regarding that. And that is actually where most of the change in galaxies took place in the context of the cosmic science. Therefore, we are going to focus on this distant universe, or in other words, the high redshift universe, um, to understand how galaxies grew and evolved in time. But I mentioned that the distance and time is related, right? The closer we look, uh, is we, we look at the more present day universe and the farther we look, we look at more distant universe. Some of you, again, may be very familiar with this concept, but for those who are not, let me explain quickly by giving you an example. How do we actually see the past, right? Now, imagine a baby is born, as babies do, apparently 50 times every minute in our country. Uh, anyway. Imagine a baby is born, and at the same instant, a ray of light leaves that room where the baby is born, and the light ray starts traveling. In about five years, the, ray, the light ray reaches a distance of five light years away, obviously. By the time the baby actually has grown up by five years, right? But the light is just traveling on and on. Let's go for 10 more years. The light that had started when the baby had born is now 15 light years away from Earth, but the baby is now a teenager, actually, on Earth. Now imagine if there were an alien right here, 15 light years away from us, looking at the Earth with a very, very powerful telescope, they would see the image of the newborn baby, because the light just, that had just reached the alien had actually left Earth 15 years ago. Now if the alien were here instead, they would see the image of the kid, the five-year-old kid, although the kid is now no longer a kid. The kid is a teenager, as I said. Now, extending this analogy further, a few more years later, the light from the baby will reach even further. And then if there are other observers there, 25 light years away, they would still see the baby as a newborn baby, even though in reality, 25 years later, the baby has grown up. So if we look at this, or if we imagine this analogy in respect of our universe, we can imagine the time when time close to Big Bang as when the, when, when the universe was born, when the universe was a baby. 
And slightly after that, when, as I said, the high redshift universe, and the universe had grown to become a small kid, right? Which means that we, being on the rightmost edge of this figure, as we see into more distant galaxies, the, we see the light that has been traveling to us from farther and farther, we can actually see more and more into the past of the universe, right? Because if we are seeing a light that has been traveling from 10 billion years, for example, then the galaxy that we are getting the light from, we are getting the light as the galaxy was 10 billion years ago. We are never seeing the live version of the galaxy. We will never be able to see that because light takes a certain amount of time to travel from one place to another. This is essentially how we look into the past. The farther back we look, the more into the past that we are looking. And it's not just necessarily very, very distant objects. Every time we look at the sun, the light rays from the sun takes about eight and a half minutes to reach Earth. So every time you see the sun, you're actually seeing a past version of the sun, an eight and a half minutes old, older version of the sun, right? It's the same concept, just applied to a much larger scale. But now that we have clarified what I mean by looking into the past, let's see what do we actually look at or what do we actually collect uh, from these galaxies of the past. So we obviously use telescopes, but briefly, how do telescopes work? Well, they work pretty much as if a bucket collecting rainwater would work, right? Like we have rain falling, you have raindrops, and then there's a bucket. Raindrops will get collected in the bucket, fair and simple. Same thing with the telescope, right? There are photons or light particles as we know it. They're coming from whatever target we're interested in. There are photons coming from stars, there are photons coming from galaxies and so on, and they're all coming towards us. If we have a telescope, we're basically gathering all that photons and that's what's giving us the information of what we want to know. It is obvious that if we have a bigger bucket, we will be able to collect more rainwater. Similarly, if we have a bigger telescope, we will be able to collect more photons. That means the bigger the telescope, the better because we will have more light and therefore we will have more signal and therefore we will be able to look farther and farther back into the past. Now, just a brief overview of what are the current telescope facilities or the big or large telescope facilities available uh, in the world uh, in different countries. Two examples are the Keck telescopes or the pair of Keck telescopes in Hawaii, uh, where I had had the fortune of going and working and observing from there. Um, and these telescopes are actually the largest, currently the world's largest optical telescopes. And then there are other telescopes which are not as large, but close to the size of the Keck telescopes, for example, the Magellan telescope, but the Magellan telescope is in Chile in South America. And there are various other facilities like that, which help us look very, very distant, we look into the very, very distant universe by collecting lots and lots of photons by being big buckets, basically. There are also telescopes and observatories that are about to come, and co come online. They have not been started yet. They're currently under construction. One such very, very popular example is the giant Magellan telescope. Now the size of the Keck telescope, or the size of the mirror of the Keck telescope is about 10 meters across, so 10 meters in diameter. The Magellan telescope, when it will be completed, when it will be finished, it will be 30 meters in diameter. So you can see, you can see it's three times the diameter or in, in sense, nine times the area. So basically it will be nine times more uh, strong than the Keck telescope, than the largest telescope that we have today. It will have nine times more the light collecting capacity, which is why it's so important and which is why people are spending billions of dollars and you know, hours and hours trying to perfect this technology. And this will, when this comes online, this will also be in Chile. And then there are phase-based telescopes, right? Which are not on the ground. They are orbiting the earth. Like for example, the Hubble Telescope, which I'm sure all of you know, it has been orbiting the earth for like 30 years now. And then there is the James Webb Space Telescope, which is scheduled to launch next year. And this will be twice the size of the James Webb Telescope. And being in space, it will be free from all the problems that the ground-based telescopes have. For example, the light that they're collecting will not come through the Earth's atmosphere. So it will be a much more clean, much more sharp image of whatever they will be looking at. So these are some of the things that are developments that are going on in this field in terms of having new observatories or new telescopes. 
So with these telescopes, what do we actually look for when we are trying to study galaxy evolution? Well, we look for spectra. Now we, again, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you know what a spectra is. It is basically just uh, light after being passed through a prism, right? It's basically the rainbow of the light. Light has different components, different colors, and at some colors, at some wavelengths, the light is stronger, at some other wavelengths, the light is weaker. That is basically what, uh, what we call spectra. I'll be showing examples of real spectra very soon, but just quickly, how, how do spectra originate when we are looking at galaxies or stars? Well, instead of this uh, cartoon diagram, let's look at an animation which might be slightly easier to understand. So on the left, this white circle, it's, imagine this as a star, this is what's giving off the light. And in the middle, this atom, uh, the diagram of the atom, this represents the gas cloud that is surrounding the star. Now as light from the star is passing through the gas cloud, some of the light gets absorbed and the result is what we, ha what we call the absorption spectrum or absorption line. The light that was absorbed by this gas cloud can then be re-emitted in a randomly different direction, and that's what we will call the emission line or the emission spectrum. In reality, when we actually look at observed data, we see a combination of both. We see emission lines, we see, we see absorption lines, and we also see the continuum, which is basically just the light from the star without having passed through any gas cloud around it. Now, just to go into slightly bit more details about the physics, but again, very basic physics, about how do these emission lines originate? Why, why would light from the star passing through the gas imply that there, the, that there would be more light emitted by the gas? Well, this has to do with the atomic structure of the gas, right? Let's say the gas is composed of this atom. Now this atom right now is in its ground state. The electron is in its lowest energy level, all well and good. Now, this is the first way or the first uh, method or first process by which emission lines can originate is called photoionization, which is ionization by a photon. Now, as a photon comes and hits this ground state atom, it basically splits, it basically ionizes the atom into an ion, which is positively charged, and a free electron, which is negatively charged. So far, so good. We don't have new light yet. We just have an ion and an electron. Okay, so what happens to this ion and an electron? Now, let's say there are many ions like this, which have been produced by photon ionization, now they can go a process, what we call recombination or de-excitation or both. For example, recombination is when the ion is there, sitting right there, you know, doing nothing, and then suddenly an electron comes and hits it, and the electron actually gets absorbed at the highest energy level of the ion. Now, because the electron gets absorbed, now it's in an excited state, right, because it's the highest energy level. It's not its ground state. What does the electron do to come back to the ground state? Well, it emits some energy. The amount of energy it emits corresponds to a photon of equal energy. And that is the photon that we receive. That is the photon that is emitted by the gas cloud as we see it. Now the electron can come back to the ground state either straight from the excited state, or it might come back in two or more steps by you know, going to intermediate state. And then it can emit more photon of a different energy. All right, so this is one, one way how light or photon can indirectly lead to more emission or more photons from the gas cloud. There is another way which is called collisional excitation or collisional de-excitation, which means here we don't require an, an, a photon to be incident, we just require another free electron. Now again, there is this ground state at home sitting there doing nothing. Suddenly, a high energy free electron comes, collides with the atom, excites this atom because it imparts some energy, which energy is not sufficient to ionize the atom, but it is sufficient to excite the electron from ground state to an excited state. And the energy that had, and the electron that had collided, that leaves, that just goes on its own path. Now, what we are left with is again, this excited atom. This excited atom will obviously try and come back to the ground state. Again, same as before, by releasing more energy in terms of photons as the electron cascades down to the ground state. One other option and one final option that I'm going to show you of how emission lines can originate is by reprocessing star light, right? And the light from the star is, again, photons. So when a photon comes and hits 
an atom in the ground state, if it's not sufficiently energetic to actually ionize the ground state atom, it can excite the atom, just like a collision with an electron excites the atom when the photon is absorbed. And again, just same as before, that excited electron will come down to the ground state by emitting light or by emitting photons that is equivalent to the difference in energy of the two states. And this is the light, this emitted photon is what we see as emission line or emission um, spectra. So why do we have different, why do we have emission at different wavelengths? Right, right, as I hinted, if you know, if you in the energy level of atoms as very, very simplistic, you know, one, one dimensional levels, n equals to one, two, three, four, and so on, if there is a transition from n equal to four to n equal to one, that obviously has the highest energy because that is losing the maximum energy. It's going straight from n equals four to n equal to one. And because the energy is higher, obviously the frequency is higher or the wavelength is shorter. In other words, this is a blue light, right? If the electron had instead transitioned from n equals to three to n equal to one, it would have slightly less energy because the difference in energy between one and three is less than between one and four. So that would be an intermediate wavelength. And again, similarly, if the energy, if the energy jump or the electron jump is from two to one, it would have the lowest energy or conversely, the longest wavelength, and that would form our red light. That is how we get a spectrum. We get some emission at blue, some emission at red, and so on. But these emission, uh, these wavelengths that we get the emission at, they are very, very specific to these energy level transitions. That is why by looking at exactly at what wavelength these emission lines occur in our data, we know exactly what transition uh, is going on in the gas cloud, which in turn tells us exactly what atoms are present in the gas cloud and how many of those atoms are present in the gas cloud. So how do we actually relate this sort of atom transition model to the gas cloud? Okay, now imagine this is, this is a photograph, nice pretty picture of an which basically is the cloud surrounding newly formed stars. As you can see, there are stars in the center. Now imagine there's a star and that's giving off light. That light strikes the gas around it. It does all these excitation and reprocessing of light that I explained, and all of these things happen, and then the gas itself emits more light. That light that the gas has emitted travels, it keeps traveling, it comes to us, we collect it through our telescope, then we pass it through an instrument called a spectrograph, excuse me, which is basically a prism. And as we all know, a prism splits it into its constituent wavelengths. And that's how we get a spectrum as our observed data. We get at every given wavelength or at every given color, how strong the light is. How many photons do we have in the blue color? How many photons did the gas emit, uh, did the gas emit at the red color and so on? That is how we get a spectra. In reality, a spectra from a galaxy looks somewhat like this, right? We have on the y-axis, we have the strength or how much light did, you know, is contained. And on the x-axis, we have wavelength. And then of course, it looks like a wiggly spectrum. These peaks that you see, the upward peaks, that's what we call emission lines. That's what I am interested in mostly. That's what my research is based on. But then there are also these sort of downward crops these are absorption lines. I will not be going into details about absorption lines, but they are also extremely important and can tell us a lot about what is going on inside the galaxy just by looking at this spectra. Okay, so now we know how a spectra looks like. There are more, many different ways of collecting the data or collecting or making the observation. Two most popular sort of uh, categories of spectroscopy, as this technique is called, are IFU spectroscopy or long slit spectroscopy. I'll first describe briefly what is IFU or integral field unit spectroscopy. Now remember, I showed the spectra in the previous slide, right? This is an information as a function of wavelength. We can get this information for every point in the galaxy, in the face of the galaxy. So if you imagine the galaxy as an image, and if I imagine the image has an X axis and a Y axis, in position, for every point of x comma y, we can get a spectrum, which means that if we do that, 
for every point in the galaxy, we will have a star. Eventually, if we stack all those you know, points side by side, we will have what we call a data cube. It is a cube because two axes at the front is position and position, X and Y, which shows the spatial extent of the galaxy. And the third dimension, the depth, is the wavelength, which is the spectrum. So if you can imagine, when you look at this data cube from front, you will see the image of the galaxy. When you see it from the side, you will see the spectrum, right? Because at every given spatial location, we have, an, we have a record of the spectrum of the galaxy. And if I instead, looking, instead of looking at a spectrum, if I say, okay, I just want to see how this galaxy looks like at this particular wavelength. We can also take a slice at a single wavelength as it's demonstrated in, in this figure, right? If we want Ayan, to see, so uh, let's see how this galaxy, yeah. Can you maybe speak a bit louder? Yeah, sure, sure, sorry. So as I was saying, let's see if I, if we want to see how, how the galaxy looks like in different light, instead of trying to see at the spectra at different points of the galaxy, we can also do that with this IFU data cube. Because we have a data cube, we have the information at a slice at the blue wavelength, right? We can ask, okay, we, let's see how this galaxy looks like in blue light. We can just take a, a, what you call a slice at the wavelength and we will see the galaxy in the blue light. If you want to see how the galaxy looks like in the red light, we can take a slice at the red wavelength. If you want to see how a particular point in the galaxy uh, looks like in the whole spectrum, we can do that too. So this is just one kind of spectroscopy. It is called IFU spectroscopy. It is relatively recent. It's been only, or it's been popular only about a decade or just a bit longer than that, which is relatively recent in terms of the history of, you know, observations of galaxies. The other most popular uh, method of spectroscopy is called long slit spectroscopy. The difference or the main difference between long slit spectroscopy and IFU spectroscopy is that as an IFU spectroscopy, you have a data cube. At every single point in the galaxy, you have a spectrum. So you have three dimensions. In long slit spectroscopy, you have only two dimensions. You do not have the X and Y of the position. You only have one of those. You have one of the position axis and you have the wavelength axis. The way it works is, as shown in this diagram, so imagine there's a star or galaxy or whatever, which is emitting the light. The light comes through and we present a slit or we pass that light through a slit. That is why it is called a long slit spectroscopy. We do not take the entire light from the entire galaxy. Once we have the light going through a narrow slit, then we use a diffraction grating or a prism or whatever to get a spectra, right? Once we get the spectra, as we can see, we have two axes. There is x-axis and then there is wavelength axis. The x-axis tells us is a, is a position axis along the face of the galaxy. So we can only take a slice of the face of the galaxy. We can't have both x and y as we can in IFU. So we have to choose a slice of the galaxy and along that x-axis on every point, we, have, we can have the spectra, right? For example, here, the dark bands on that, on that plate um, is basically the emission line, right? And in my very, very poorly hand-drawn red spectrum, you can see wherever there are dark bands, um, you will have a peak in the spectrum across the wavelength. So basically this is how long slit spectroscopy works. Now these are, the, as I said, two main uh, modes, two main methods of taking or, or recording spectroscopic data from galaxies and stars. Right. So now we know that we have a spectra. We have, a, we have used the telescope, we have pointed the telescope at a galaxy, we have used some kind of uh, you know, prism or something, and then we have got the spectra. In the spectra, we have emission lines. What do we do with that, right? This, let's say this is our data. We have flux or the amount of light on y-axis, we have wavelength on the x-axis, and our data looks like this. Obviously there'll be noise in the data, which is why it looks, does not look smooth, it looks kind of rugged, it looks like a mountain. What do we do with it? We do a technique or we perform a technique called emission line fitting. This is basically fitting a simple emission line model 
to the data. When I say an emission line model, most often it is basically fitting a Gaussian to a data. I, I trust we are all familiar with what a Gaussian looks like. So just this is basically what we do to the data. We fit a smooth Gaussian to the data. Uh, and then once we fit the Gaussian, the Gaussian gives us a few parameters, right? The Gaussian usually has three to four parameters. What are those parameters? Let's have a look one by one. The first thing the Gaussian will tell us is the height, right? How tall is it from the base? Second thing we know is the width of the Gaussian. How broad is it at the middle? Third, we know the level of the continuum. Now by the continuum, I mean the height of the base itself. Like how high is the whole base from the zero level, right? That is what we call the continuum. And the lastly, we, what we get from emission line fitting is the centroid or the central wavelength. That is where the Gaussian actually peaks. Now, why do we need these four quantities? What use are they? Well, these are basically what observational, astro observational astronomers like me spend their whole lives with, these four quantities. Because these four quantities tell us almost everything that you want to know about that galaxy or about that gas cloud surrounding the star. For example, the width tells us about the turbulence in the gas, right? How, how much random motion is there in the gas? How disturbed is the gas? Or is it completely still and nice? If the gas is completely still and nice, the emission line will be very narrow. If the gas is very disturbed and shaking vigorously, the emission line will be much broader. The continuum tells us about the star that is actually emitting the light before it passes to the gas. The continuum tells us about the age of the star. It tells us about how big the star is, how massive it is, and so on. The centroid, that is the peak of the Gaussian, tells us how fast the gas is moving respect to, with respect to the stars, right? For example, if there is a huge explosion, and because of the explosion, there is a lot of gas being thrown out of the, this centroid will be shifted either to the left or the right. And that shift tells us how fast is the gas being, is being expelled from the galaxy? That, is very, that can be very, very important for people like me who study how galaxies grow and evolve. But most important parameter is what we call the flux, which is defined as the area under this Gaussian. It's literally simply the area under the Gaussian, which has a formula which involves the height and the width, right? Now this flux is important because the flux tells us about a lot of different things. About the, about the gas surrounding those stars. What are the different things that the flux tells us? Well, as we, say, as we showed, this, there's this nebula, and let's say we have pointed our telescopes, we have got the emission spectra, we have fitted the emission line, and we have got the flux by computing the area under our Gaussian. What do we do with that flux? Well, that flux can tell us about how much oxygen is there in the gas. It can tell us about how densely that oxygen atoms are packed. It can tell us about how hot the gas is, how much pressure is there, and also, as I said, how fast the gas is moving. But how do we get to all these things from the flux? That is where this new concept, this new thing called nebular emission line diagnostic comes into play. Maybe now, I will take a small break are here. basically just formally yeah, yeah, let's, let's take a small break. Thank you. So there are a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, so the first question is from Vandana. Oh, good. Uh, she is asking, how do we differentiate between the spectrum from a star and that from a galaxy? Oh, very good question. Um, you differentiate primarily by looking at the absorption and emission line. If you are looking purely at a star, there will be very few emission lines, right? Because as I, as I explained, emission lines originate because the starlight has passed through a cloud of gas. If you're looking at purely a star, it has not gone through much, uh, the light has not gone through much gas. It has only passed through the atmosphere of the star itself. And there will be some absorption by the atmosphere of the star itself. And that is why we see a lot of absorption lines in what we call a stellar spectra which means the spectra from the star. If the spectra is coming from the whole galaxy instead, then there will be, okay, first of all, it will be much more complicated than the spectra from a single star because it, is, it has a lot of things inside it. It has stars, it has gas, it has dust, 
um, it has, if the galaxy has a huge black hole, it would have a, the, the, you know, the imprint of the black hole in the spectrum. So it'll be much more complicated and there will be a whole host of not only absorption, but also emission line. So that is how we basically distinguish between the spectrum from a uh, star and a galaxy. Yeah. The next question is from Divyanshu. Do we need, uh, do we need separate detectors inside a single telescope to gather different wavelengths or we need entirely separate collecting areas? Um, sorry, I couldn't get the question. Can you please repeat? Yeah. Do we need separate detectors inside a single telescope to gather different wavelengths or we need entirely separate collecting areas? Okay. Um, the short answer is the first one. We do not need an entirely separate collection area. The collecting area or the bucket, as I explained, is the mirror of the telescope. That stays the same. Once we have gathered all all the light in the mirror and the mirror obviously reflects all of that light to certain instruments depending on what we want to do with that light for example if you want to do spectroscopy as i usually do i direct all that light being reflected from the mirror into an instrument called spectros uh, spectrograph right and usually graphs have capacity to observe from within a certain range of wavelengths now it depends on the spectrograph some spectrographs can only work in the blue, blue uh, wavelength range. Some can only work in the red wavelength range. Some telescopes, that's why they have more than one spectrograph, right? Some of the half of the light is sent to the blue spectrograph, the red part of the light is sent to the red spectrograph and so on. But we do not need separate collecting area. Yeah. Next, Aishu has multiple questions. So she's asking, so for observing a galaxy, it is required that light is scattered in radial direction to us, whether it be, whether it be radio wavelength or X-ray emission observed from a galaxy, right? Yes, the light has to be scattered towards us. Okay. For observations, how significant is the effect of intergalactic medium? trying to observe, right? It, it literally depends on the individual galaxy. And that actually uh, is the sort of the livelihood of a whole section of scientists, whole section of astronomers. They work basically on studying the intergalactic medium by looking at galaxies that are sitting on the other side of the intergalactic medium. The light from the galaxy passes through the intergalactic medium. Some of it gets absorbed. And depending on how it gets absorbed and where exactly it gets absorbed, we can tell a lot of things about the intergalactic medium itself. So this is an entirely different field. And that is, you know, it's a perfectly uh, common and perfectly popular thing to do. So whether your observations will be affected by the intergalactic medium or not, depends on whether there is much intergalactic medium between the galaxy that you're looking at and yourself, right? That's the first thing. The second thing that I will quickly mention is even if, even if there is an intergalactic medium between the observer, the intergalactic medium will only contribute to absorption lines. It will only absorb some of the light. It will not contribute to emission lines because emission lines only come from very, very hot ionized gas, which is only found out around stars, which means the emission lines will still be coming from the galaxy. So in your spectra, if you have both absor absorption and emission line spectra, with the emission lines, you can study the galaxy from which the light is coming. With the absorption lines in the same spectra, you can study the intergalactic medium through which the light has passed before it reached you. Okay, in relation to the above question, she's also asking, does it give information about the anisotropy of such media too? Sorry, but can you please come again? It got broken up a bit. Yeah. Does it give information about anisotropy of such media, the intergalactic medium? Uh, yes. If you can make measurements along different lines of sight, as we call it. So basically, if you have, you know, um, if you have an intergalactic medium spread over an area of your sky and you have different lines of sight, basically you have gathered light from different, along different lines, intersecting that intergalactic medium, then it will give you an idea of the anisotropy of the intergalactic medium. But if we have just one line of sight, then you have only one data point, then you do not really know about the anisotropy. Okay, guys, if you all have any more questions, you can raise your hand or post them to the chat 
uh, I'll give you a 30 second window and if I see no more questions, we'll proceed. I think you can continue. Okay. Um, just so I know, I didn't notice exactly when we started. How much time do I have remaining? I will talk accordingly. So I think you have around 30 to 40 minutes. Okay. With Fair enough. Thank you. All right. So as I was saying, we have these emission lines and we have computed the flux under the area of these emission lines. And we want to convert these fluxes into these meaningful properties that we actually want to know. You know, how much oxygen, what's the density, what's the temperature, and so on. The tool that we use to convert this thing, the magic tool, it's called emission line diagnostics, right? Now, diagnostics, or when I say diagnostics, what I mean is a formula or a set of formulae which literally takes the input, takes the flux as the input, and gives the quantity that you're interested in as the output, right? It's very simple in terms of actually doing it, but I'll just give you an example of a couple of diagnostics to explain or to demonstrate how exactly people come up with this diagnostic. On the plot, on the figure on the left uh, that you see here, it is basically a set of uh, models, or again, simulations, simulated data that tells you that, okay, if my oxygen abundance is this on the x-axis, the ratio of my nitrogen flux, the H alpha, H alpha is a certain um, emission, sorry, certain wavelength at which we see emission from hydrogen. And again, N2 is also a certain wavelength at which we see emission from nitrogen. So if you take the, if you compute the flux of both of these, the N2 flux and the H alpha flux, and then if you take the ratio of these two fluxes, that actually has a very strong relation with how much oxygen is present in the galaxy. The more the oxygen is present, the more will be the value of your ratio. That's what people have found out using theoretical models. That is what we see in this particular plot, right? So how is this useful for observation? Now in observations, you, when you're doing the observation, you already have this model. You already have this theoretical, um, the relation, the curves, right? What you get from observations is basically the y-axis, right? You get the N2 to H alpha ratio, the flux ratio. As you can probably imagine, the y-axis on this, on this plot, I can literally draw a horizontal line, see where it meets my plot, and then drop a vertical line and find out what my oxygen abundance is, right? This is basically a way of using these models, also known as diagnostics, to convert your flux to whatever quantity you're interested in. Now, I am primarily interested in the oxygen abundance, that's why I showed this, but there are many other diagnostics for all other different physical properties. There can also be diagnostics which are based on not theoretical models, but observed data itself, which is what we see in this plot on this figure on the right-hand side. Here the axes are flat, uh, uh, swapped, so you, know, you have to please make uh, allowances for that. Here the abundance, the oxygen abundance, or the amount of oxygen is on the y-axis, and the flux ratio of those same pair of uh, lines, emission lines, is on the x-axis. Here, the authors of this paper have demonstrated again that, okay, if you, there is a very, very tight relation between the ratio of the nitrogen and hydrogen flux to how much oxygen is present in galaxies. So if you have the ratio of this flux, you can basically uh, get, by interpolation, you can get how much oxygen is present in that particular galaxy or in that particular uh, gas cloud, depending on what you're looking at. So this is, this is how emission line diagnostics work, right? And this is how we get um, physical quantities from emission lines. Now, you, the I, main problem, and going again, going back, yes, please. Can you briefly say what is the physical reason as to why there is a relation between the two, oxygen abundance and the ratios? And I yes, see it's absolutely. also decreasing towards the end rather than increasing. Yes, yes, absolutely. So the reason is because uh, the oxygen and nitrogen, they are produced primarily in the same method inside the star, which is called primary nucleosynthesis. 
right? So that is, so for example, okay, so let's, let's say we focus on this left-hand side plot for now, right? We see that the curves are increasing up to a certain point and then they are decreasing. And I also see at the bottom of the plot, the first part is called primary nitrogen and then the last bit is called secondary nitrogen. What that really means is, as I hinted at the beginning, all of these metals, all of these elements, they are produced, they are produced eventually in the core of stars, right, by nuclear fusion. Now, oxygen and nitrogen are produced primarily through the same method, right, which is called primary nucleosynthesis, right? That is what you call, that the nitrogen you get from primary nucleosynthesis is called primary nitrogen, which literally means it is formed by nuclear fusion at the center of a star. Now, there could be secondary nitrogen. Now, secondary nitrogen is formed by a slightly more complicated process. It is not just based on nuclear fusion of two elements, right? It takes place when the star has enough oxygen that it can go into a more complex process to again produce some more nitrogen, right? So in that process, in that second process, oxygen is actually used up to produce nitrogen. Unlike the first process where, you know, everything starts from fusing hydrogen and helium and goes from there. That is why all the nitrogen that is produced in the first kind of process correlates with how much oxygen is present, right? For example, if we have a certain amount of hydrogen or helium in the core of the star to begin with, and they're, they're fusing, they're doing nuclear uh, fusion, the amount of oxygen will, that will be produced and the amount of nitrogen that will be produced will be correlated. If there is more oxygen being produced, there'll be more nitrogen being produced and so on. But the moment that the amount of oxygen is enough that it can now start this secondary, more complex method of using up oxygen to produce nitrogen, then the amount of oxygen will decrease slightly even if the amount of nitrogen increases or vice versa, right? That is why we see the slight anti-correlation at the very high uh, value of oxygen abundance. So the correlation or the anti-correlation is basically the result or it stems from how these elements are produced inside the star. That is why we see this correlation. That is why if we can see the amount of you know, nitrogen uh, flux, it relates to how much oxygen is present in the galaxy or vice versa. If we can see the amount of oxygen flux present in the uh, in the galaxy, we can have an idea of how much nitrogen is present there as well. I hope that's clear. If it's not, please feel free to ask me questions. Yeah, it was very clear. I mean, that's, right. that's awesome. Okay. Okay. So, right. Thanks. So now that we have these emission line diagnoses, but for people who, like me who use the diagnostic, we do not necessarily have to deal with the details uh, of, you know, of inside the black box. This is kind of like a black box for us. We take the formula, we put, we feed in the flux, we get out the oxygen abundance or whatever we are interested in. Now, as I was saying, the main problem and our main question that I started with is that we want to see galaxies which are distant from us. We do not, we are not super interested in galaxies that are nearby because they have already been studied. Now, there is a big problem in trying to see galaxies that are far away from us. The big problem is that we only see the ultraviolet spectra from galaxies that are far away. This is because of the redshift. Now, I'm again sure most of you, if not all of you are familiar with the idea of redshift. That is, as you know, as the farther we are from one another, like farther the galaxies are, the faster and faster we are moving away from each other. And that because of that motion, the waves which are reaching us now, because of stretching of space time, the waves are becoming redder and redder. That is why we call redshift, right? So that is why if we are looking at galaxies that are really far away, we only see the ultraviolet part of the galaxy. Therefore, in order to get these physical information like oxygen abundance or pressure or density, we need to develop and build new diagnostics which are applicable for the ultraviolet spectra. Until now, or until a few years ago, I should say, all these diagnostics that I showed you or all of these were developed, keeping in mind the optical or the visible part of the spectra, because that is what we saw in the nearby galaxies. Because in nearby galaxies, the wavelength that we comes to our eyes is the visible wavelength. But for distant galaxies, that is not the same. Even if they are, we are observing in the optical wavelength, the light that has started from the galaxy actually was in ultraviolet. Now I'll show you, I'll demonstrate this, uh, I'll demonstrate exactly how and why this happens 
with an animation. So this is a spectrum, or this is a, let's say a diagram of a spectrum. It does not really matter of what object this is a spectrum of. Let's imagine this is a spectrum. The, the black or the gray line is actually the spectrum. The blue, orange, red, and brown lines, they are, uh, well, I did, actually they are transmission bands, but that's not important here. Just consider them as the observed wavelength. And on the x-axis, corresponding to the black spectrum, we have what we call the rest frame wavelength. The rest frame wavelength means the wavelength of the light when it started from the galaxy those billions of years ago. By the time it reaches us, it becomes the observed wavelength, blue, yellow, red, and brown. Now, obviously, the observed wavelength is fixed because, well, for a given telescope, if you're using one particular telescope, the telescope is able to observe at a certain wavelength. So that wavelength is fixed, but given, but depending on how far the galaxy is that we are looking at, in other words, how far, how, what is the redshift of the galaxy, the rest frame wavelength will be different for a given observed wavelength. So how exactly is that? Oh uh, yes, and I should mention, higher redshift means more distance, as I mentioned before, right? The larger the redshift means the more far away the galaxy is from us. Now if I stop this, so right now in this animation, uh, which I haven't started yet, you see the redshift is 0.0, .0 which means that this galaxy is very close to us. It's literally right next to us. That is why <clears throat> the optical wavelength uh, is the same in both rest frame wavelength and observed wavelength. Now let's say, oh, I should mention the optical wavelength. When I say optical, I mean towards the right or towards the higher values of wavelength. When I mean ultraviolet or blue wavelength, I mean towards the left or lower values of the wavelength, right? Now let's start the animation. It's fast at the beginning, but then it slows down in the end and it'll keep looping so that I can keep explaining to you. So as you see, as the number at the top, the redshift increases, which means the galaxy is going farther and farther from us. Uh, obviously in reality, the galaxy, this particular galaxy is not moving far from us at you know, such high speed, but just imagining if that same galaxy had been at a different redshift from us at the same observed wavelength band, so if you focus on one of these colors, let's say if you focus on the yellow observed band, for a given redshift, you would only see a given part of the rest frame wavelength. Depending on the redshift, if the redshift is low, you will see a more you know, redder part of the wavelength or the right side. When the redshift increases, at the same observed wavelength, you see a more bluer part of the rest frame wavelength, right? As you see the, rest, the spectrum shift, you see the ultraviolet wavelength for high redshift galaxies. This is how it works. So the main problem, as I said, is when we look at high redshift or high, very, very distant galaxies, we see the ultraviolet. And we have to figure out uh, diagnostics which are applicable in this ultraviolet uh, wavelength regime. This is, again, just an example of how a real spectra for an ultraviolet wavelength or a high redshift wavelength looks like, right? This black line, the spectra, all of those dashed uh, lines, they are, uh, they are marked or there are the demarcations where we expect to find, you know, several absorption lines or emission lines. I have uh, additionally pointed out the oxygen-3 emission line at a wavelength of 1,660 angstroms. And then there's this carbon-3 emission line uh, at a wavelength of 1,907 angstroms, right? So these, as you can see, they are peaks, which is what we expect our emission lines to look like. So this is just an example of how actually the real world is uh, looks like and now again on this we have to perform emission line fitting and so on and so forth so this is basically what i had to say about the general idea right now if you have more questions at this point about any of the concepts that i discussed i'll be more than happy to take them uh if not i will move on to give a very very brief introduction of what i actually do in all of these general de uh, galaxy evolution research fields so I'll give you a few seconds. I'll give Surendra a few seconds to tell me if there are more questions at this point. Yeah, guys, you can either raise your hand if typing is limited, or you can type for the phone. It's up to you. And you can continue. 
there are no questions okay thank you all right so where do i actually fit in into this thing well i look at a specific class of galaxies called gravitationally lensed galaxies i will not go into the details of what gravitational lensing is because that's not the focus of this talk if you want if you can if you want to ask a question i'll be more than happy to answer and explain later but there are just some a special kind of galaxies which helps us they are lensed um when i say they are lensed i mean they are magnified by a certain physical phenomenon and because they are magnified we can see these galaxies even if they are really really far away in other words even if they are very far back in the past and they form these nice little arcs which is also very useful and makes them easy to spot easy to observe these different images are just different examples of gravitationally lensed galaxies uh, they sometimes can form very funny images like on the one on the left it's actually called the cheshire cat because it looks like a cat apparently uh, and the one on the very right it looks uh, like an eye so it's actually called it's nicknamed the cosmic eye i personally observed this particular galaxy actually i observed this tiny blob of this galaxy and then i applied a bunch of these ultraviolet nebular emission line diagnostics to that right and the idea was to compare how the new diagnostics that has which has been developed for the ultraviolet how do they function how do they perform compared to the old and existing optical diagnostics right it's basically a comparison of the new versus the existing what i do is i do all of the process that i that i explained before so i observe i get the emission line i get the flux then i take the ratio excuse me i take the ratio of the flux of two lines and i use a the diagnostic then i get the parameter that i'm interested in in this particular case the parameter is the pressure which is on the x axis the y axis is a histogram or it's a pdf which basically tells you what is the probability of the pressure being so and so for this particular galaxy now there will be more histograms being added to this plot so before i do that i should just quickly mention when we have a dashed line or the dashed histogram that refers to an ultraviolet emission line ratio or ultraviolet diagnostic when i have a solid emission a solid histogram that will refer to an optical emission line ratio and the purpose or one of the purposes of my project was to compare what how different or do we actually get different results using different diagnostics on the same galaxy right that is the key point we are observing the same galaxy once with optical diagnostics once with uv diagnostics do we get the same answers or not when i say same answers i mean this dot on the bottom right that's the median pressure right that is the pressure that i would that about quote if i'm going to ask me okay what's the pressure of this galaxy i would quote that value which is 8.3 ish or something right so the actual value doesn't matter the point is we are about to compare different diagnostics we are about to compare dashed lines with the solid line so this is one particular diagnostic using the carbon 3 emission line ratio there is one optical diagnostic with the oxygen 2 emission line ratio and as you can see it gives very different results from the uv when i say different results i mean the dot of the brown curve is at a very different value of pressure than the black dashed curve if we add a couple of more diagnostics to this so there is one more uv diagnostic so one more dashed histogram which gives a super high pressure as an output and then there is one more green histogram which is based on the sulfur line ratio which gives again a lower value of pressure as the output so again when i say the output i mean where those colored dots lie on the x axis right that is my eventual result that is the pressure that i get from that particular ratio of line now the question obviously comes why is it different right if you are looking at the same galaxy but just with two different uh wavelengths one with optical and one with one with uv why is it different and is it is it something that we did wrong or is it something that is actually you know happens in in reality well it turns out and thankfully that it was not something that i did wrong because otherwise i would never get my phd uh it is something that is actually expected right and the reason is in this cartoon diagram you see this is again a cartoon diagram of a of a gas cloud around a cluster of stars there are lots of stars in the middle 
there is this cloud of gas which has different atoms or different ions. That's what the labels are, right? H2 is a singly ionized hydrogen. Sulfur 2 is singly ionized sulfur. H1 is neutral hydrogen. Oxygen 3 is doubly ionized oxygen, which is O++, and so on, right? There are these ions of, ga of gas which are present in the gas cloud. Now, as you can see, that the three, the doubly ionized species, which actually lead to the ultraviolet emission, they are present closer to the stars than the oxygen two or the sulfur two. The sulfur two and oxygen two, they are present farther from the stars. They are present towards the edge of the ionized gas. In a more quantified way, if you look at the plot on the right, this is basically how much emission we have from a certain uh, ion or certain uh, emission line species as a function of distance from the star, right? Now, which goes from zero to one because it's normalized. As you see, the purple and the red line, which, which traces how much emission do we get from the oxygen in the gas? How much emission do we get from the sulfur in the gas? Those emissions basically arise at the very end, at the very edge of the gas, right? Very, very far from the gas, uh, sorry, very far from the stars. They're not towards the center. On the other hand, the green and blue curves for the silicon and carbon, respectively, they are actually maximum at the middle, at the center of the gas cloud, close to the stars. They actually are weaker at the outskirts. They, are, they drop down at the outskirts as we go towards the edge of the nebula, which basically means when we are trying to understand or when we are trying to study the pressure of, these, uh, of this gas cloud using the carbon and silicon lines, we are actually studying a very different physical region in the gas cloud than when we are using the oxygen and sulfur line. They probe different areas. The UV lines probe the middle in this case, and the optical lines probe the outskirts. And that is why they give different pressure because there is more pressure in the middle, there is less pressure in the outskirts. And that is why the result that we got was justified and this is how we explained it in the paper. And this is just one particular example of you know, what research I do. Ian? Uh... There is another, yes please. Yeah, so can you go back to the previous slide, please? Yep, this one. Yeah, so here, uh, if I try to understand, uh, is it something like that the silicon and oxygen are produced later and that is why they're towards the center? And uh, you, have, you have the solar winds, et cetera, that are happening that push the other lighter elements which were produced uh, previously to the edges. Can we understand it like that, or is there some other reason, or is it actually just a fit to data? Mm, it, no, there is there is a reason behind that, and it's slightly different from what you mentioned. The main reason is so, as I said, right, the O2 or the S2 basically is singly ionized oxygen, right, O plus, which basically means if I take you know one electron out from oxygen, um, that would be singly ionized oxygen. Or if I take one electron out from sulfur, it will be singly ionized sulfur. The carbon-3 and silicon-3, they are doubly ionized species, which means we have taken two electrons out from them, from both the carbon and silicon. Now, obviously, you can imagine more energy is required to take two electrons out than to take one electron out, right? Which means that the oxygen-2 and sulfur-2 ions, they, they can be produced by, in certain way, by a weaker light, right? By a less energetic light. The carbon-3 and silicon-3, they require a more energetic light. In scientific terms, what we call a harder ionization spectrum. We want more energetic photons to be able to produce the doubly ionized species, to be able to take two electrons out from an atom. And because the starlight is obviously coming from center towards the outside, the, there is more strength in the light. There is more hardness in the radiation when it's close to the center. That is why it has, you know, all that energy is spent creating this doubly ionized carbon or doubly ionized silicon. By the time the starlight has reached towards the outskirts, it has lost, lost that energy. The energy that it now has is sufficient only to take one electron out from the atoms by collision. That is why at the outskirts, we only have singly ionized species like oxygen-2 and sulfur-2. Is that, is that clear? Yeah, just to add a little bit to that, so, I mean, I forgot a little, like when you were talking well, all about the emission, etc. But 
even if oxygen and sulfur were present at the center and you have this uh, energetic photons coming in can't they also ionize oxygen sulfur and uh, and the rest of the energy of the photon maybe go in terms of the kinetic energy of the electron or something and that way one can also expect uh, more oxygen sulfur atoms also being ionized uh, so or that's what i, I don't yes. understand Yes, yes. No, you're absolutely right. At the at the center, also there can be oxygen, singly ionized oxygen and singly ionized sulfur. However, what I'm trying to what what the main thing here is, if we look at the y-axis of this figure on the right, is normalized emission. It is not necessary that the emission of the carbon at let's say half the thickness is more than the emission from oxygen two. In fact, you are are right. The emission from oxygen two and sulfur two they're always overall much stronger than the carbon 3 and silicon 3 right in, in real data in spectra we see the emission from carbon 3 silicon 3 they're much weaker what this plot shows is the normalized emission which means that compared to the maximum of the emission of that particular ion what is the what's the emission along the radius so compared to the maximum emission of oxygen where does that occur the maximum emission of oxygen occurs around 0.9 ish or something. Okay. The maximum emission of sulfur occurs almost around one, whereas the maximum emission of carbon three and silicon three occurs almost around zero. So it is a normalized emission. This does not mean this particular plot does not mean that at thickness of 0.5, carbon three and silicon three are more uh, than sulfur three, because it's it's normalized so that each curve is reaches one. That's why, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, the overall sense. level can be different. Okay, okay, got it. Thank you. All right. Okay, so as I was saying, so this that was that was part of what I have uh, done as uh, in my research to try and understand the ultraviolet diagnostics, good or how useful or not useful they are when we try to compare them to optical diagnostics because that will. Be be very very important when all of these future telescopes are coming up right like i showed you the giant magellan telescope or the james Webb space telescope the giant magellan telescope or the james Webb space telescope and they once they come online they will be actually able to see very very far or very very far back into the past or far into the distance whichever way you want to put it and because they will be able to see very far into the distance they will be actually seeing the ultraviolet part of the spectrum of these galaxies. So we need to have these tools to understand the ultraviolet part of the galaxy before these telescopes come online. That is why we need to understand these diagnostics now. The other very important thing, and briefly I will mention, uh, which I have done in my PhD, is to understand how the spatial variation or, or the spatial quality of the image changes when we look at distant galaxies, right? Now this is something we can understand from intuition or common sense. If you look at some, a nearby object, we can obviously have a very sharp detailed image. If that object is very far away, which is like the distant galaxies on the left, it becomes very difficult to resolve the galaxy. What it, mean, what it means in common terms is that it becomes very blurred. The image becomes very blurred because it's far away, because it's hard to see. Now that obviously brings into the question, that all these observations that we are doing for the distant galaxies, we are looking at these very kind of messy, noisy, uh, blurred images. So does that actually affect the conclusions that we are drawing? Does that actually give us the right answers that we want to know? Uh, how, how do we make sure that we are measuring the things correctly, given that our data quality is so blurred because the things are so, so far away? So one way to do that is to produce mock data or produce synthetic data. What that means is I took a simulated galaxy, the one or one of the ones that I showed you in the beginning, and I converted it into what it would look like if that galaxy were on the sky and if I had observed it through a telescope, right? So I'm creating mock data. And the reason I'm creating mock data is because I can now put the galaxy as far as, you know, as far away as I can because it's a simulated galaxy, right? And then I can see if by put, placing the galaxy farther and farther, if my scientific results are affected or not. So briefly how it looks like is on the left here, we see 
how the simulation actually looks like, right? This is a simulation on the left, how it really is. It's so, as you can see, there's so much structure, there's so much elements and it's very detailed and clear and sharp. What would this galaxy look like if I had, if this galaxy were in the sky and if I had look, looked at it with an unrealistically good telescope, right? With like basically no noise and very high spatial resolution, right? When I, when I, I'll keep saying spatial resolution. When I mean spatial resolution, I mean basically the quality of the image or how sharp the image is. So if there's a very sharp image, this will look like this, right? On the right. As you can see, it is already quite deteriorated from the real image, from the real simulated galaxy. It is already starts to look quite blobby, right? What would it look like with a good telescope, right? The simulation would look like this with a good telescope. Even now, it does not have any noise, but real telescopes, real instruments do have noise in the data. If we looked at it with a realistic telescope, the same galaxy on the left, the simulated galaxy, would look like this on the right. Now, as you can obviously tell, the image quality is deteriorated heavily. Now, what we see when we are doing observations is we, we see things like this, things like the right-hand side image on the sky. The things actually are like the left-hand side image, but we see them like the right-hand side image. So there has to be something done and there has to be careful analysis carried out to, under, to make sure that we are not making any mistakes in our calculation because we are not getting good enough quality data. So one of the things that I did is I, again, I looked at the oxygen abundance and how it is distributed in the galaxy, right? So one way to say that, or I'll actually skip these few slides here because this plot is much neater. One way, to say, one way to quantify how the oxygen is distributed in the galaxy is by measuring the gradient, right? So there is usually more oxygen in the center of a galaxy and less oxygen in the outskirts of the galaxy. So if you fit a straight line, you would get a negative slope. That negative slope is what we call the gradient. I was, I was explaining what is a, a gradient of oxygen abundance, right? So oxygen abundance is typically in the galaxy that's high in the center, and then there's low oxy less oxygen in the outskirts. So if you kind of plotted oxygen abundance uh, versus the radius of a galaxy, you would get a linear uh, negative slope. And that slope is called a gradient in the oxygen abundance. And that gradient is very, very important for people who study galaxy evolution. But the problem is, because I showed in the previous uh, images, that the observed galaxy may not look anything like the real galaxy. So even if the real gradients are something, after we observe through a noisy, blurry data, the gradient we get back from that might be very, very different. And we might need to do corrections based on that. But that is basically what I have tried to do here. So in this particular uh, figure, in the x-axis, you have the real gradient. And in the y-axis, you have the measured gradient. So you can think of it, this as the real gradient, the, the true values are on the x-axis, and the apparent values are on the y-axis. The different colors are different quality of image. The black is the blurred image. Yellow is the sharp image. So you can see, when we go towards yellow, when the image quality is very sharp, the measured gradient and the real gradient, they lie on the dashed diagonal line, which is the one-to-one -one line, which means the measured gradient is almost as same as the real gradient when we have a sharp image, which is what it should be. So that's perfectly fine. But the problem comes in when we do not have a sharp image. If we have a blurred image, like the blue or the black data, even though our real gradient is something, our measured gradient is artificially shallow. Our measured gradient is very different, right? There is this trend that you can see from um, bottom to top on the on the left hand side, which goes as you as your image quality deteriorates further and further. And now this is again a real effect, and this is what I devoted part excuse me part of my PhD to try and correct for these for real observations. That again, that's something that I did. The last thing, and this is something that I have not really worked on much, but this is an animation, so I thought I could show you is these gradient can also be affected by how inclined your galaxy is, right? The galaxies are not always perfectly face on. When I say face on, 
I mean, you can see the entire face of the galaxy. When I say edge, John, I mean, you are viewing the galaxy right from the edge. So the galaxy would look like a line to you, right? Depending on how inclined the galaxy is, the gradient might be different, right? That's what this an animation shows you. The, the red line is the true gradient. The blue line is the apparent gradient or the inferred gradient. Inclined the galaxy is, the more different is the apparent gradient from the true gradient, right? And that is what we think, these are the same thing in the plot on the right. Now, I have not done much uh, in, this, in this particular uh, topic yet. Uh, this is something that I will be doing in future, but there's an animation so I thought I should show it. And that is basically all I had to say. The take home messages that I would uh, impress on is that there are, again, going back to the basics, uh, there are two different ways of doing things broadly in astronomy. Uh, one is observing through telescopes, and number two is simulating things in your computer. Often people do both because the combination of both gives you the ideal uh, advantage of trying to understand what is going on in the universe. Uh, the second point that I covered is spectroscopy, which is an essential tool for people like me who study the gas in the galaxies and how the gas evolves, how the galaxy changes, and so on. And thirdly, we will be able to see really, really far back into the past uh, when we have these, all these new uh, instruments, new telescopes coming up, very, very large telescopes, both on the ground and in space. Uh, when they come up, they, that will have a huge prospect for astronomy in the near future, in the next decade or so. Uh, and lastly, when we're looking at things that are really far away, we have to carefully analyze um, the amount of, you know, blurredness, if you like, or the amount of noise in the image before we actually extract the physical information from these distant galaxies. So those are the basic points, and these slides are available online at this particular um, ID if you, if you want to access them later. And, uh, and yeah, that's all from me. I would be happy to take questions now. Thank you, Ayan Lecture was really wonderful. Uh, I believe every one of us learned a lot. So guys, now you can either raise your hands or post your questions to the chat. Uh, so Vandana is asking, what are some of the tools used to do spectroscopy? Some of the tools used to do spectroscopy? Well, that's a very good question. But the answer depends on which angle you're looking at. Like the answer depends on your role, essentially, right? For example, if you're looking at it from an instrumentation point of view, um, then we have telescopes, obviously, then we have spectrographs, and then there are different spectrographs used for uh, different kind of objects. There, is a, there, are, there could be a different star, and then there could be spectrographs which have been built specifically for galaxies and so on. So those are sort of the physical tools that we need for spectroscopy. If you, need, if you mean more in terms of uh, analysis tools, then there, for example, the emission line fitting is like bread and butter for all of us. Who, who do spectroscopy. Uh, and then there are things like uh, statistics. We have to do a lot of statistics, uh, especially when you're observing a lot of different galaxies, a lot of different emission lines. Um, statistics is a, you know, or some tools of statistics can be very handy to try and understand the level of uncertainty in your data uh, and, and so on. I don't, anything else is not coming to my head right now, but there are these things which can be very useful when you're doing Okay. Any more questions, guys? You can raise your hand or post it to the chat. So I and I myself have uh, two questions. So one was uh, maybe not, but uh, do you think there can be degeneracy between this uh, inclination and the uh, non-sharpness of the image since it's so distant? Like because you showed me, you showed us that the gradient can actually. Uh, be different, right? Because of the uh, not so much yeah. resolution in the image, and you here you sh you're kind of showing us that uh, it can also vary because of the inclination. So, do you think, given exactly. the systematics, uh, can we actually differentiate between these two, or is there a degeneracy? Uh, no, it will be very different to distinguish between these two. So, it's a very good question because that is something that people have recently started looking into trying to uh, disentangle the effect. 
uh, but so far it has proved to be, proved to be very difficult because when you have any change in inclination of the galaxy, effectively it is having the same uh, same effect as changing the spatial resolution because the, there is more, more galaxy. So as you make the galaxy more and more inclined, if I run this, if I pause this, for example, right now the galaxy is face on. So right now when I'm looking at a certain part of the galaxy, I see just through that, you know, the thin disk of the galaxy. But now when the galaxy is almost edge on, even if I'm looking at that same spot here, I'm looking at more of the galaxy, right? To the same spot. There's more material along the same line of sight, which means it has the same effect as spatial resolution, because that is exactly what spatial resolution does, right? When you have insufficient or very coarse spatial resolution, you have big pixels, which means that you have, you're summing up or you're averaging over a bigger area of the galaxy for every pixel. And that is not good for your data. That is not good for your results. So in a sense, the inclination and lack of good spatial resolution, they have the same effect because of the same reason. And that is why it is very hard to disentangle the effect of the two. The only way or one of the important ways or one of the promising ways that can be done is through forward modeling. So you have to model the effect of both to get what something I'm looking to do in the future, and then you can provide corrections for that based on both. But it'd be hard to hard to isolate the effect. Okay, thank you. And the other question is in relation to the. I mean, it sounds really fascinating. And uh, so, how do you actually get these? Uh, mock data that you told us like you have a simulated image and then from there you're saying that uh, you're getting an image right. so to get the mock data yeah so we we have a simulated galaxy and from a simulated galaxy, so i have this i've basically built this pipeline or basically built this code which converts the simulation into a mock data cube the essential steps of that code is in the simulated galaxy it identifies where there are young stars because most of these radiation that ionizes the gas comes only from young massive stars so the code basically first identifies the young stars around which there will be ionized gas because that is where the emission lines originate next we add all the uh, next we model these model the emission from this ionized gas uh, using something called photo ionization modeling i didn't go into details about that but i can answer questions about that later if anyone wants to reach me later about that. But then there's this step called photo analysis modeling, which basically predicts what sort of emission or how much emission you will get from each of these uh, gas clouds around the stars. And then we basically add these stars along every line of sight. That's how I get this particular image, right? And then the next step is to blur the image as progressively as I go. So to blur the image, I kind of convolve it with a Gaussian beam or whatever shape of beam you're interested in, you can convolve it with the beam that will blur the image, make it, you know, uh, kind of hazy. And then I also add noise with by in controlled amount to make the image look noisy. That is how eventually I have a cube. I have the spatial information X and Y and each point in the uh, at X, X, X comma Y, I have the spectrum because that spectrum is what I got from the photo ionization model from the predicted uh, spectrum around uh, a cluster of stars. So that's how I get the data cube, the mock data cube. Okay. And when you're adding this particular noise, is it uh, something realistic uh, or like, I mean, do you actually see uh, like during an observation, uh, I, like I think we do know what are the different types of noise sources, at least to some extent. So do you actually uh, model those noises and put them here, or do you do something else entirely? Uh, captured a bunch of photons from this galaxy through a telescope. And then we do exactly what happens inside a telescope, right? The, the light goes and falls from the detector. The detector has some noise, which is called read noise. Uh, and then there is Will be a noise because of the, the photon count itself, which is called the Poisson noise or the short noise. And then there is noise because of the sky background, right? Because not everywhere in this galaxy is the, sorry, not everywhere in this image is the galaxy. There are parts of this image that is just background, right? And we do face a lot of background noise in real data. So that's why we actually 
you know, pointed our telescope at a blank patch of the sky to get how much noise we get from a blank patch. And then we added that to this data cube as well. So the end product that you see that has all these three different kinds of noise uh, modeled into it. The amount of read noise uh, is, is flexible here. It depends on what, which telescope you want to mimic uh, because different telescopes have a different amount of read noise. The amount of short noise depends on the level of your data itself uh, by definition. And then the amount of sky noise uh, is, is taken from one, as I said, one observation of a blank patch of sky. Okay, thank you for the answer. Uh, and next we have a question from, uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so Divyanshu is asking, do we have to manually analyze the blurred images or we first filter them through a program or something in order to figure out the structures? Sorry, was your, did you ask, do you have to manually, uh, I didn't get the word after that. Yeah, do we have to manually analyze the blurred images or we first filter them through a program or something in order to figure out the structures? Right, that's a very good question. And that is also uh, something that a lot of people do. Uh, mostly, including what I have done, is we have a pipeline, we have a data, we have a piece of code, whether it is you know publicly available software, depending on uh, which uh, telescope you are using or depending on, or it could be your own software, but we do have a single set or, or just one set of code that takes your data cube as input and then it spits out whatever you want. Like in, the, in my case, I wanted oxygen abundance gradient. It spits out the gradient, right? So there is no manual analyzing as such. Uh, no matter whether the, whether the data is good quality or bad quality, you have the and this is something that is important in astronomy and I'm assuming in, you know, in all fields of science. When you're trying to compare two things, the both of the things have to have passed through the exact same set of process, right? I can't, can't say that Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I was mentioning that it's very important that if we want to compare two different things or two different end results, it is very important that both things or all the things should have gone to the exact same set of processes. For example, whether my image is very sharp and nice and clear or it, it is blurry and noisy, doesn't matter. We do have to filter it to the same data analysis pipeline. And yes, to answer your question, there is usually a single or a, you know a set of processes uh, in terms of uh, called a pipeline, which we we put both our good data and also our blurry data to the same pipeline. There is usually no manual intervention needed in this kind in this field, right? It's all automated. It's all to the code or to the pipeline that you have built or someone else has built that you are using. But there is no manual intervention needed, even if the data is noisy. If the data is noisy, your pipeline should be able to take care of that automatically. Yeah. So guys, any more questions? You can raise your hand or post them to the chat. So meanwhile, Ayan, are there any open source software which can uh, do these two things? Like first one is uh, the one that you're showing us to convert a simulation data into a blurred image. And the second one was the pipeline that you were talking about. Uh, yeah, there are, there are quite a few actually. It depends on uh, what exactly your science goal is because each software obviously has been built by a person or a set of people and they had built it according to their own needs. For example, my software that I have used to make this is also online on GitHub. But you know, if you want to do something exactly like this, then sure, you could use mine. But if you want to do something slightly different for a slightly different science goal, then you can use the other ones. There are other ones like uh, one that comes to mind right now is something called uh, SimSpin. It's a software that has been that was developed by a student in uh, UWA, University of Western Australia. Uh, but then they do it for to convert semi-analytic models to uh, to um, mock data cubes. Whereas I have done it for uh, MHD, magnetohydrodynamic simulations, to real data cubes. 
So the short answer is yes, they are available, uh, but it's not like a software that is sort of commonly available. It's just that people who make them for their own use, they do make it publicly available online on, on the GitHub page or, or Bitbucket or whatever. Uh, the link of those things or the description is usually found in those particular papers that has come out with the code. Yeah, that is what I was referring to. Like if you have some code on the GitHub or Bitbucket or something so that maybe if you don't mind if it's too much, not too much, uh, can you try to link uh, one or two in your, uh, to me or you can send it to me or in the, uh, put it up in the readme file of this workshop. It will be helpful maybe. Like if people yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, I have put my, sure, sure. Absolutely. I have put my, Yeah, we can't hear you, Ayan, again. My contact, my email, you can feel free to email me, or there's a contact form in the, uh, what do you call that, on my website. So, you know, wh whichever way you want, please feel free to reach me if you have a question later on. That's what I want to say. Okay. I think with that, we'll conclude the talk. Uh, and as Ian was uh, suggesting, if you all have any more questions, you can always reach out to him or you can uh, message me too. If supposing that's something you are uh, more comfortable with and I'll try to convey the questions with Ian too. So anyway, uh, thank you Ian again very much. The talk was really good and we learned a lot. Uh,